Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome in to episode 32 of Kayfabe Council, a show where we review and critique news topics and segments in the world of professional wrestling. My name is Pretty Tony, and alongside me, as always, is TF Joker. Joker, what's the crack, brother? What's going on? We are recording on New Year's Eve, PT. That's what's going on. It's almost down to 2022. Let's go. As we're winding down on day of recording, it's the end of 2022. As you're listening, we'll be in 2023. We hope your year has gone by in a really strong and wonderful fashion, and hopefully your New Year's is off to a good start. What uh, Joker, if I may ask, what have your just overall thoughts been of your 2022 so far? Hmm. Yeah. Meh. <laughs> I mean, no, it's been good. We started, you know, we we, we started this uh, this podcast that we we talked about for doing the longest time, joked about it for the most part. Uh, and then we were like, yeah, let's let's uh, let's just shut up and do it. And then, um, yeah, starting different uh, different things in my life, going back to school, you know, getting uh, getting the stuff done that I think that I need to better my life. So I feel like twenty twenty two was pretty solid. You know, it was it was a nice little footstep into what could hopefully be a really good twenty twenty three. But I've got to you know got to keep that up and uh, hopefully. Pump the energy up a little bit more. What about yourself? What did you feel like your 2022 has been? Yeah, I mean, it wasn't too bad. I got to do a couple of different things myself. Obviously, like you before mentioned, we got to start this whole show and everything like this. So that's been quite the interesting the uh, allotment for basically the past six plus months or so. I ended up moving cross country. So, I mean, that was uh, quite the quite the journey and things as such. So. Definitely filled with some changes and some new opportunities and different things. So 2022 certainly has been quite the year, much like you said. And it's uh, not been just a year for us, but a year in the topic we talk about wrestling. Things have changed. Things have happened. And, you know, we're going into 2023 with some, uh, well, major storylines. Quite the understatement for sure. 2022 has been quite the interesting year. Folks leaving, folks coming back, some big changes in companies, and man, it's quite the uh, the roller coaster per se. But as we do with any time, as we get towards the end of the year, we we kind of reflect on sort of what happened and kind of uh, things we enjoyed, the things we didn't like. But then, like you had mentioned, looking onwards and forward to hopefully improvements and greener pastures in 2023 so yeah hopefully we get some more interesting things and fun stuff and i'm sure things to talk about in 2023 i'm just all about that fun stuff like as long as as long as the workers are having fun and doing stuff that's you know at least semi-watchable it's going to be better than what's come before it so uh you know i'm all good with that I just, uh, I know that there's only really one storyline that I really care about right now. Um, so hopefully there are a couple more that developed, a couple um, at AEW that developed, some in WWE. I just hope that everybody um, in all the companies, uh, you know, going forward in the 2023, uh, all the workers just uh, have a standout year and everybody gets what they want. I just thought that's for them to get what they want and have a really good year. Just gives me joy that I get to watch some good wrestling, witness some good storylines, and just have some fun. Because that's what this is all about, really. Couldn't have said it better. We're always looking for the talent and the workers themselves to just have a good time. And if they have stuff that they enjoy in terms of storylines or matches or title runs, things like that, then obviously it makes it fun for us to watch as the consumer and for us as pundits to kind of just talk about and reflect on so i'd agree yeah more better things to come which would translate for more better things and fun stuff for us as well kudos 100 mm, percent. all right before we get into the show proper uh, we here at kayfabe council are saddened to hear about the passing of don west our thoughts are with his family friends, 
and fans at this time. All right, as a reminder, you can find us in video form at youtube.com slash kfabecouncil and in audio form wherever you get your podcasts from. On this week's episode, we look at John Cena and Kevin Owens. Did they face a united Roman Reigns and Sami Zayn bloodline? Well, let's find out. We finally saw the return of the man himself who can't be seen, but we got you. John Cena returned on Friday Night SmackDown to team with Kevin Owens to face off against the incomparable and surprising tag team, which we thought we'd never want, but we did get, of Roman Reigns and Sami Zayn. A couple things of note here. Obviously, we talked about the return of John Cena. This is his uh, first match here in 2022. Made an appearance over the summer, so uh, kudos to John. Kevin Owens. Interesting. I've been getting hot as of late in the latter portion of the year. If you've been with us for a little bit, you know that we have been enamored, so to speak, with Sami Zayn and his relationship with the bloodline. So if we talk about and think about Sami Zayn, where his year started, to where his year is winding down, quite the interesting journey for Sami and, of course, Roman on his history-making tour. It seems like a simple matchup, but hot dang, the players in this matchup, Joker, quite the uh the interesting parties shall we say yeah um and i saw a tweet earlier on and please forgive me i i I forget who it's from but it literally just popped back into my head about all three guys that are in the ring with john cena shared their debut on the main roster in an angle with john cena so obviously roman reigns in his angle with the shield sammy and kevin all you know obviously having their shots at the u.s title whenever they came up from the nxt brand so I mean, this is this is like full circle for some of these guys. You know, they starting they're starting their uh, careers in the main roster with this guy, and now they're in a main event on a SmackDown at the end of the year with this guy. Who honestly, some of them in this ring, arguably all three of these guys, are just absolutely huge megastars now. Um, along with this guy who is John Cena, the man who can be seen these days. So it, it's it's such a such a cool little thing to see, um, and you know you were you were given given it off to me yesterday was whatever we were doing this pre planning that I sounded like just such a mark for uh, for John Cena like honestly I do sound like that, but he he brings like this energy for me that I'm like I hate you <laughs> but I love you at the same time like. You don't really do very much, you know. You're John Cena, but I just love the fact that you know he's he's he is pure joy whenever he's in the ring. Like he is having such a fun time, and like we just said in the intro, there, like you know, I like it whenever the the guys and the girls are having this fun, um, because that's whenever you're doing some of your best work. And for all the negatives that John Cena has, which we'll get into later on. He just makes a match more fun. Honestly, he just adds an element to silly. And that's what I expected of this match. And I got it. And I was super happy. Certainly to say John Cena's matches stand out for a plethora of reasons, as we will definitely mention later on in the show as we get to the match proper. But actually, interesting little morsel information I didn't realize, but upon you saying it, yeah, quite the quite the journey of these men in relation to John Cena and then sort of sort of apropos of where they're at now, uh, sort of top of the card in their sort of respective stories and kind of their championships and their kind of journey as well to sort of end the year with a match with the kind of stalwart that is John Cena. So very, very interesting kind of little subtext or footnote here. Uh, thank you for sharing. Appreciate it. Yeah, it was something I saw on Twitter. So I, I really, I, it popped in my head and I went, I read it after I uh, had watched the show this afternoon. So I'm really sorry, but 
Uh, I will uh, do better to make sure that I give credit where credit's due. But that was I was absolutely amazing, and I did not realize that myself. Interesting. Well, I appreciate that for the morsel and for the the internet wrestling community for finding out all these little pieces here. We appreciate you as well. Before we get into the match proper, we did have a little bit of a story thread, a little narrative throughout the show. As we get into uh, the beginning portions of SmackDown, we see Sami Zayn walking backstage. He knocks on the Bloodline locker room, and Paul Heyman answers. They hug enthusiastically. Heyman asked Zayn about Hanukkah, and Zayn responded by asking Heyman about Ramadan. Sami says he came here to talk strategy with the tribal chief, and Paul says, they were just talking about the things he said last week, declaring himself, of course, for the bloodline. Paul says, Your pledge of loyalty and the declarative statements you made against John Cena and Kevin Owens, it's the passion the tribal chief has always seen in Sammy, and Sammy brought that to the surface. Roman is very proud of you. The mood shifts as Heyman says Roman Reigns standing in the ring with the crowd chanting for Sammy wasn't the right optic. Sammy asks if Roman said anything, to which Paul quickly responds, does he have to? Heyman states the key to the island of relevancy is to be three steps ahead of everyone else. It's then Heyman gets the green light to stop the delaying tactics and let Sammy in. Sammy enters the Bloodline locker room, and we are left with a laughing Paul Heyman. Just seeing Paul Heyman's head pop around that door at the start of this segment, I giggled. Like, it's just, you know, completely sideways. The Paul Heyman head just eyes wide going, oh. Um... It was super funny to see, and it's it's definitely one of those meme formats that's going to happen eventually. But um, I love their little uh, repartee between these two characters as well. The 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 whole uh, how was your Hanukkah, was your Ramadan, you know, blah blah blah. Um, the, these are two of the unsung heroes. Well, Sammy's getting his flowers. Like everybody knows, Sammy is is the thing. But like these two characters, whenever they're in any uh, sort of storyline whether it be this last past year with the bloodline or anything they've been in before you know there's a reason why everybody joins them whenever he goes ladies and gentlemen my name is paul Heyman." like you know, for years whenever he did the brock lesnar shtick and he still gets that now and i love that for him and this little back and forth is is so, something i would like to see more of sometimes but i i like that it's sporadic you know we don't always see it i like those little uh those little uh sprinkles in there and they're, uh, the fact that at the end, Hamer goes, enough stalling tactics on you. It's like, uh-huh, we know what you're trying to do. Uh-huh, very good. And then they just go in, and um, it, it just feels to me like Sammy is back to being the butt of a joke that he hasn't heard yet, and I'm really here for it right now. I like it. I like to see this. Yeah, little seed plantings. Uh, the first thing that came to mind is we've been sort of enamored with this Bloodline storyline. And we've talked about these little touches that all these characters involved to, to Jay, sort of the way he'll kind of contort his face in a reaction to something and then, you know, kind of Jimmy kind of doing these little things solo always remaining stoic but then occasionally kind of looking over kind of throwing a glance giving just a little but paul paul has done really kind of good in terms of remaining and not overshadowing these guys kind of sort of again being an auxiliary player but him reacting to things him kind of getting shocked if if somebody will say something like oh like how you know giving those sort of bright wide eyes like i can't believe you said that so to your point about having Paul kind of just give a little something, but working within the collective has just been fantastic. And to see him bounce off of Sammy like this was just fantastic. But that being said, I, yeah, I found the notion of interesting verbiage uh, called delaying tactics. 
Very, very interesting choice of words there. Why makes you think what, how, or why would Paul, who, you know, obviously is the advocate and the uh, counsel, the tribal chief, if Sammy is in and is a part of the bloodline, why would he maybe be stalling? I'll just use those words, so delaying Sammy from coming into the bloodline locker room. Interesting. There's there's a lot of speculation could be had here, you know. Um, but I think the timing of this and then the very next segment is actually the Usos and Solo going out for Solo's match with Sheamus. Because otherwise you could be led to believe that maybe he's talking to the Usos beforehand and the Usos are just about to leave. At least that that was my headspace at the time. Why did he need to let? And then you see the match. I'm like, well, they were already in Gorilla at that time, like surely. Um, so I mean, it's one of those things that you kind of look at and go, "Oh, interesting." I appreciate you giving the benefit of the doubt. You're like, "Oh no, Paul's just talking to Usos and and Solo, just going over strategy." Okay, cool. Sounds good. Read nothing more or don't read anything else about it. Fair enough. <laughs> that was my initial thought. 100% was like, oh, you know, it's probably this here, you know? And then obviously two seconds later, we find out that they're on their way to the ring. So that can't be it. You know, it, obviously it can't be that. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's fun to speculate what they're implying by this uh, delaying tactics, stalling tactics, whatever the words he used was. But um, it's just interesting having the past few weeks things not go Sammy's way and Sammy to be frustrated um, and last week's promo to be so impassioned for him to be overshadowing the tribal chief that was even mentioned here is like it's not a good optic it's like mm, Sammy is now starting to be seen as overshadowing the tribal chief what's going to happen for him here can't be good that's quite the interesting nomenclature and, and choice of words and we talk about seed planting and storylines. So we end this particular segment with uh, Paul Heyman on the outside, sort of maniacally laughing. But then we fast forward to a later on in the show. This is post match for the Usos and Solo who have already finished their segment. We have the bloodline chatting in their locker room. Sammy wants to make sure they are on the same page for their big match against John Cena and Kevin Owens. So, Sammy asks Roman if it bothered Reigns that the crowd chanted for Zayn in the previous promo. The camera slowly pans in on Roman's face and hangs for a minute and the tension builds in the room. But Reigns responds, God no, why would it? And we see Heyman and the Usos very relieved. Roman continues, The way you were locked in? How can anyone pay attention to anything else other than the words you were saying? The conviction you said them with. If you have 10% of that tonight, it's a night off for me. I don't have to do anything. Zane says tonight is going to be a great night for the bloodline. After Sammy does his handshake with Jimmy, the camera pans over to reveal Roman's smile turning into a scowl. I had to rewind because I thought I, I was so I was so uh full. My eye was like watching the, the handshake between Jimmy and uh, Sammy. I was like, ah I think it's going and then uh, then Cod went to went to the next segment. I was like, I'm just gonna go back here. Yeah, I wasn't. It wasn't full. It's was like angry Roman, you know, sort of. He had that smile, and uh, during the segment, whenever uh, it was, uh, whenever Sammy out and out asked him, like, did that bother you? You could see Paul Heyman in the background with his eyes bugged out. He was like, oh no, something's gonna happen. I was like, Shouldn't have mentioned that to Sammy. He wouldn't have asked. Um, but yeah, this this little bit, I I love the deflection from Roman as well. Like, like hell no, why why would it? 
you know, you know, it's a night off for me. And I've made fun of him before, you know, everybody knows that there's always at some point or another, there's always a part-time wrestler as the champion. And Roman is the part-time champion at the minute. I've always, I've also kind of said that he's a part-time person in his own storyline because the bloodline revolves around him, but really for a while it was about Sami and Jay. So to hear him sort of acknowledge the fact that, no, nah, like you would give me a night off. It's like, well, that's nothing new for you, Ramin. You know, so come on. It was, it was such, it was such funny um, direction from Sami to straight up go for the jugular and ask the question and for Roman to take that pause and just be like, angry to think no 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 hell no why would i be angry so it was really really good only for this his face at the end to break again and be a little bit angry and you're just like you know what his facial expressions are just so good at this point they're selling this and they're they're annoying the heck out of me by not cutting to the chase um so yeah it's just it's so good and it's keeping me Really, it is keeping me enamored with this storyline because I was a bit bored of it for a while there at the start of December. Um, but now it's bringing me back in again and I'm loving it all the more. This is another example of the collective, the bloodline as a whole, just adding so much to a simple backstage promo that could have been just sort of thrown away or forgotten about. Again, this is just Roman and Sammy talking, but. To that point about when Sammy just, you know, kudos to him, not beating around a bush, just comes out and asks a question. We, you know, we see Jimmy and, and Jay on the couch and all over, sort of in the corner off to the side behind Roman. And they get really nervous. And I, I mentioned that the tension builds in the room there when Sammy asked that question about was Roman bothered and hangs on him and they're a little worried. And then that kind of quick character break. No, no, it's all good. Why would why would it type of thing? And every, and you see, and I think the first thing I looked at was Jimmy and Jay, and they were like, oh, okay, just thank goodness. Kind of like, okay, you know, uh, was, was it about to go down? Okay, no, it's not going down. And of course, Paul, his reaction. So that notion again of them just man, just giving it socks and just without having to say anything added so much to the the scene itself to the. To the promo to the backstage segment was fantastic and again man you hit the nail right on the head in regarding of the nature of it's not quite like fast break week to week neck snappingly fast kind of storytelling we've been letting things kind of maturate and kind of brew and the nature of you said it it was Sometimes it feels like there's sometimes things not kind of going on. But yeah, Roman, to your point, a section of this has been Jay's interactions and relationship with Sammy. And then kind of Jimmy kind of being in and out in there. And then we added a little Solo and him kind of popping out and Solo kind of being looked out after by Sammy rather than maybe his own brother. So there's been elements here. And like you said, in the absence of Roman being there full time and all the time, he's been a little sort of outshadowed or some in some aspects being played as a second fiddle to the majority of kind of the excitement or the fun or the nature of the storyline that is the bloodline, which again has been encompassed Sammy and his sort of reactions to the other players in the faction so and then we finally kind of the shoe fell off and we've asked the question was roman bothered and you know what he says no why would it bother him so apparently roman is comfortable enough to say you know what we have a strong member of the faction that's getting over brother yeah it doesn't doesn't bother me i don't sweat it we all know he's lying. We all know he's lying. The tribal chief head of the table. Mon, he's lying through his teeth. Those perfectly white, sparkly teeth that he got done. Lying straight through them, PT. It heaves him off and it makes me so happy. Like every time you have an interaction where Sammy gets a pop, and Sammy gets the, the chance, 
and you see Roman's face in the ring, and he kind of stares daggers at the back of Sammy's head, uh, or he just kind of, you know, has that little bit of a uh, little bit of a mean mug on him. Like, you know, it it's so fun to see because you can tell that there's something gonna happen, and when that doesn't happen, you're like, come on. Just, just like just poke it do something come on and that's what i that's where i am with this storyline right now because roman's doing it so well jimmy and jay have sort of if you've noticed in the last few weeks jimmy and jay's involvement has been lessened because now sammy has had these direct interactions with the tribal chief and him and roman having these direct interactions it just makes for uh, some interesting TV whenever you've got Sami Zayn, the king of corpsing people, being so serious because you wonder how long is this going to last um, before you know Roman does something because he's being he's super serious Sami right now. He's not that jokester who was getting. Jay and, and Roman the corpse on TV like two months ago in the middle of the ring having to you know, go away from the camera whenever he said he was Usy. So this guy is directing this bloodline to an amazing story and I'm here for it and I really, really enjoy uh, Roman's interactions uh, now that he's back and in this story. Begging nothing away from Roman himself, but if we look at sort of the latter half of the year, we'll take from SummerSlam to now, right at the end of the year. The Usos, I would say, in terms of the bloodline, have been the MVP in the ring. But then Sammy, in terms of sort of promo slash entertainment value, has been the MVP. So we look at those sort of two contingents have been carrying this, and, and for the most part, as to the people, are why that the bloodline has remained relevant for the guts of six months. Now, obviously, we get with Roman being part time. Obviously, we have the nature of the world championship. So we have the occasional defense there. I think we talked about it yesterday, sort of in our pre production meeting. Think about sort of Roman's world title matches. We have uh, against the kid in Saudi Arabia, against Drew in Wales, and then against Brock at SummerSlam. And those are pretty much, if I'm not mistaken, been his defenses. So, okay, three matches. Obviously, Roman was in war games, but man, the Usos been holding it down. Basically, have been steady on TV with defenses and matches. And again, the aforementioned Sammy just delivering fantastic work in multitude of segments. So these guys have been sort of at the forefront of the faction themselves. And yeah, you know, Roman will dip in from here and there, but it's been these guys holding it down. So can't complain. It's kept our interest. It's piqued our interest and then kind of kept us engaged. So kudos to all these guys for sure. Yeah, hundred percent. And I mean, there has been lulls where I've been less interested and more interested and those have centered in and around when they try to bring Roman back into the story. Uh, and for whatever reason, Roman is part of the story and they shy away from different things. Um, so it, like Obviously, at the very start, we had Sammy trying to get himself to be a part of uh, the bloodline, and that was fun to see. The Usos kind of just go, what are you doing? Go away. Then he eventually gets Jimmy on side, and he's friends with Jimmy, and you know, he gets to be part of the bloodline. And you know their whole interaction, like you said, around this time, um, the Usos were the big thing on, on TV. Like There were defenses left, right, and center, whereas Roman was not so much doing that and then uh you know you have at the end of november here we had war games where finally the usos have fully accepted you know obviously jimmy already had but jay uh as well accepting uh sammy into the the ranks has meant that this the story there has ended we don't need that anymore like that is done no point in revisiting it um so where do we go from here well we have to bring in roman now we have to like you know there's no point in solo solo's character is stoic he doesn't speak very much if at all um so 
There's no point in having a segment with him and Sammy other than Sammy being a mentor. Um, and now you have to bring in Roman. Otherwise, what's the story? Like, what's the angle? There's no point, is there? So you have him kind of start to stir the pot, mix things up with a per choice in words with his promo where he says, I'm his only friend. Uh, and Roman was like, you know, he did the stare, the same stare that he gave whenever Jimmy went, or not Jimmy J went, uh, I don't I don't give a damn what the Tribal Chief said. And we uh, we had an absolute laugh, right, with that. Like, Roman's facials are on point, 100%. Um, so whenever he said that and he had that slip of the, the slip of the tongue, like, that's whenever I started to come back into it again. I was like, oh, yeah. Okay, well, I started, you know, that week because obviously Jay was like, don't worry, don't worry about it. You know, we know what we're doing. Um, and that is why I've been sort of interested in Sammy's tenure with the uh, the bloodline possibly coming to an end. Very interesting notion that you mentioned that sort of pre-war games, Sammy's communication or interactions with Roman would be through the Usos or Paul Heyman for the most part. And now we've seen him being able to be in the ring, be in segments, be able to talk to Roman a little bit more sort of readily and kind of things like that. So yeah, it's sort of an ending the chapter of kind of his things. And now that he's in, in the sorts, now he can, he can be in the room and sort of be able to have the company as it were of the tribal chief himself. So Excellent observation. This is one of those things that uh, I really, really have enjoyed because, uh, you know, I love Sammy. I think Sammy has grown on me, like you said, at the start of the year. Uh, has been completely different to where he is now. He was doing that whole conspiracy theorist at the start of the year. And then the Johnny Knoxville stuff around April. And then the Bloodline stuff. Like, it's... I've always liked Sammy, but I've never appreciated Sammy as much as I appreciate him now. Well said. So we finish with the storyline throughout, and now it's time for the main event. All right, Mark Henry. Hey. <laughs> Enough talk. No, I'll just stay. Gimmick infringement, brother. <laughs> but we get into the match proper now as we see John and Kevin obviously in the ring, and we see the bloodline approach and enter afterwards. In full regalia, in full entrance, in full power, as we see all the members out there. So we see Zayn and Owen start for their respective teams. Zayn has the early advantage with a side headlock. Owens fights back with a senton and drops Sammy on the top rope, giving him a bloody nose. Roman wasn't impressed as the fans chanted Sammy. Reigns tags in. And the fans erupt in Cena, and we want Cena chance. Owens considers tagging Cena in, but Reigns takes advantage and rocks Owens with a clothesline. We come back from break, and the bloodline are firmly in control. Heels isolate Owens on the side on their side of the ring. Owens fights back and rocks Zayn with a clothesline. Owens tries to tag Cena, but Reigns pulls Cena off the apron. And then Zayn follows up with a halluva kick on Cena on the outside, taking him out of the action. Inside the ring, Owens counters a halluva kick with a super kick of his own. And Owens goes in his corner, but Cena is down, not there to take the tag. Kevin rocks Zayn with a second super kick and a pop up power bomb for a very close near fall. Reigns then tags in and goes for a Superman punch. Owens recovers and rocks Reigns with a super kick as well. He follows with a frog splash for a near fall. Reigns then counters the Papa powerbomb with a Superman punch. However, Reigns misses a spear and goes shoulder first into the ring post, pitting both men down on the mat. We have a nice little fun beginning to the matchup there. Zane and Owens facing off. Don't have to tell you all the history of them. For 20 years, they can't seem to get away from one another. 
Yeah, they're having another interaction in the match here. We did end up seeing, uh, I wouldn't say too snug, but we ended up seeing Zane end up getting a bloody nose. And then we have the, of course, little uh, Ska and sort of Gaga with, after Roman's being tagged in, they're facing off. Do you want Cena? I hear the chance. Do you want Cena? Ends up getting clotheslined, but yeah, nice little play. And I thought it was smart to have, obviously, Zayn, uh, rather, excuse me, Kevin start the matchup. And obviously, the, uh, of course, why would you have Cena go in there? Probably is a little ring rust, as well as uh, wait for that big explosion when he tags in. So I thought, yeah, I thought the beginning of the match was uh, was nice and fun. Oh, 100%. I enjoyed it. I uh, I thought there was an awful lot here to enjoy, especially at the very start, like even before the match began, whenever Kevin and John were doing their intros. I do believe I mentioned to you before the show, it's like, John Cena looked like he blew himself up whenever he, he ran the ropes a little bit. It is obviously going to be a short, uh, a short little match for John, ring rust and, and all um, being completely uh, apparent. But then again, John didn't exactly have too many uh, super technical moves. But whenever he was just bounced the ropes, he ran over. You know, he, was, he walked over to Kevin. He was talking to him, and I, I just saw him kind of take a big deep breath. So I was like, "Blow yourself up there, John." Mm -hmm. But um, I like I like the fact that these boys all talk trash during the match. Like there's a lot of smack talk during this match, and I love the fact that we're we're taking advantage of that. So you got a little something on your nose there, pal. As Kevin's, you know, kind of addressing Sammy's bloody nose. I thought it was something completely different before I saw Sammy's bloody nose. Like, oh, he's being a brown noser sort of thing. But it was more a case of, yeah, he was. Then he just wipes the nose, blood on the hand, and everything. You're like, ah, okay, get you, get you, and um, yeah, just I I loved each little segment that they did because it's it wasn't anything new but it allowed guys just to hit some fun spots and everybody knows if you've been watching this for a while i hate spot fests but these guys weren't doing those big daredevil type moves they were just doing sequence of events sequence of moves and john hasn't even got into the ring yet it's been the guys who are there all the time sans roman but you know he's been included especially with that weird sort of shoulder into the ring post i want to be jr here for a minute and say that he had plenty of time to stop before he you know decided to jump off and uh and hit that shoulder into the into the the post but you know um it's uh it's one of those things that you kind of look at and say that there was uh there was maybe one or two snug moves in there and maybe one or two self-inflicted, uh, self-inflicted stupid moves too. To your point, it wasn't a crazy complicated match as we're seeing up until this point. It's more of a uh, 1970s house show tag match. It just kind of sticking to that formula, having a little bit of uh, fun. You have the, obviously the guy maybe who's not been there and sort of the crowd favorite and John. Not quite starting to match and obviously we're working to a hot tag and things like that. But yeah, it's like, yeah, you got the workers obviously just getting in there and then playing up to the crowd. So yeah, you can tell these guys were just kind of having fun and just kind of working, working to the energy uh, in the arena that night. And up until this point, yeah, I thought they were just, just like I said, just having fun with it and then, you know, kind of giving it to the fans. Yeah, hundred percent. I, I absolutely loved everything about it. And it's the fact that we, at the start, at the start of the show, if they have fun, then people are going to enjoy it. And these guys are all having fun. So we see both men are down, Roman and Kevin, in the match, in the ring. And it's at this point where Cena gets back up on the apron. The cameraman gets right next to John on the apron. And by happenstance of a series of unfortunate events, we get some of the patented exploits of John's penchant for obscenely loud spot calling. <laughs> With the cameraman right in his face, we hear Cena scream, hold on, hold on, don't move, don't move, telling Kevin and Roman to wait to build tension. 
After a moment, we have seen a scream, okay, which denotes Kevin beginning to crawl over to Cena and Roman over to Sammy. Cena then screams, slow, 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 for the men to slow down and yet again build tension. Cena then screams, tag, which indicates for both Roman and Kevin to make said tag and to have John begin his hot tag heat. <sighs> John, <laughs> John has always been known to just, when he calls spots, just literally scream them at the top of his lungs. And to be fair, Maybe it was sort of a direction. Obviously, they want to get in the corner to build up the tension for Cena's hot tag because Kevin's down. It's a double down. But man, literally the cameraman with the mic is in. He's standing absolutely next to John. And I don't say that with any sort of hyperbole or sort of facetiousness in there. He's literally standing next to John. So when he's calling these spots of hold on, don't move, okay, you know, kind of thing, it's, you can't help but hear. Even if, if he said it even sort of in a, in a speaking voice, you would have heard. But the fact that he's just belting it out so the fans in row Z can hear him. Maybe not the greatest move sort of on the production team's standpoint. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is John Cena. He has his signature five moves of doom, and his, as PT has mentioned, his penchant for uh, calling these spots on the fly. I love it. I hate it. I love it. I hate it. I love it. It's stupid. It's funny. It, it confused the heck out of me whenever I saw it, because I was like, wait, is he, is he calling spots? And what made it even better for me was he was screaming these spots and Jess Carr was repeating them. Because that's what normally happens. A ref will echo the call from someone at the side who's not screaming it at the top of their lap. Because that's what she does. She relays information to these guys in the ring. But John, John was literally, slow down, slow down. They all right, tag. You're like, John, the camera's right there. <laughs> like, you look down to your right, and he's at your ankle. And he has an open mic. So, it was a little bit, it was, it was really, really silly. He, he's well known for this. Um, there was a couple of calls from the guys in the ring before this. Uh, Sammy going for calling for the, uh, the super kick pop a powerbomb spot. And there was a snug uh, kick from Roman or hit from Roman in the match as well, uh, which you could hear Kevin say, okay, that one, that one hurt. Uh, I think it was in relation to his eye or something. Um, people, you know, can conspire that it might be a bit of a receipt from war games with the, the, the slap, but, you know, whatever you want to believe. Um, so clearly the, the ring was mic'd up a wee bit too well. Like you said, the production crew possibly forgot that John has this uh, inability to keep his mouth shut <laughs> whenever he wants to call, you know, maybe enhance spots. Like, that's what he does. He enhances spots. He, he can... In, in the years that he has been active, right, he has been a student of the game and he has understood when and where to place these things, but he is very vocal about when to place these things, which kind of defeats the purpose. <laughs> so it's great, it's funny to see, and honestly, it's just John Cena, so I can't be mad because it's it's you know it's him, it's what he would do. Maybe it's John making sure people can hear him because we can't see him. Exactly. 100%. He is very considerate, you know, for possibly the visually impaired. They need to be able to hear the action as well. Fair enough. So after that bit, we end up getting Cena obviously getting the hot tag and gets a huge pop from the crowd. 
Athena runs wild on Zane and Reigns himself. Now the finish comes when Cena and Owens hit a double five knuckle shuffle on Zane and Reigns. Cena hits an attitude adjustment on Roman and takes him out of the match. Owens then hits a stunner on Zayn for the win. And Owens and Cena celebrate to end the final SmackDown of the year. All in all, you know, the ending sequence was nice little fun, nice little throwback. The mention, sometimes the five moves of doom, at least we didn't kind of get the flying shoulder tackles. We just sort of got the greatest hits, because again, if I think back to the sort of a 1970s house show tag team match, we get the we get the attitude uh, adjustment, we get a little five knuckle shuffle, we get a little stunner ski, and uh, take it home, brother. Oh yeah, 100%. I also liked the fact that um, John came into this match sporting a sunroof, you know, a little bit of a uh, little bit of a wee spot. He's joining the bald brotherhood that we are both part of, PT. So it's nice to see that. Hopefully, someday he will, uh, you know, join us fully and not try and grasp onto there, or maybe he'll just get a hair transplant. But maybe that is also added to the fact that we didn't see that running shoulder tackle because he blew himself up because he's getting old. The man is getting old. He is kind of out of it a wee bit, you know, hasn't been in the ring an awful lot. So um a wee bit disappointed that I didn't get to see all the five moves. But, you know, uh, I, I did enjoy seeing him uh, confuse Kevin uh, with the five, uh, the five knuckle shuffle because um, obviously John does bounce off the ropes and then kind of do the, the, the sort of drop and Kevin was just expecting him just to do the drop. Um, so it, it was it was awkward. It was funny. It was John Cena. It was a good time, and I just appreciated the fact that Sammy took the pin, um, because it just there was there was a couple little bits that after this that I might have changed. I might have had the bloodline move off without Sammy, as if to sort of try and distance themselves from Sammy, but. And I was hoping to see that, but he was already round after getting pinned. He was already round to Roman, seeing if he was okay, and all this here. So it's one of those things that that could have been could have been changed. But um, yeah, it was good to see that Sammy was the one to take this pin, and from KO makes the most sense. We're not going to see Roman take a pinfall or submission. Probably not going to see John take a pinfall or submission. So it was going to be either Kevin or Sammy. So. Makes sense, and a nice little pairing to sort of Kevin to hit the exclamation point where Sammy was the catalyst in the War Games match, but then Kevin sort of gets his heat back in here to sort of end the year on Sammy hitting him with the stunner. So if I recall, it wasn't a long match. It was maybe the guts of 10 minutes or so, if that, but yeah, we really didn't see sort of the Bloodline special with tons of distraction slash interference. We didn't see that, which was an interesting, I guess, sort of story piece here. So, yeah, I mean, for the most part, they just let Roman and Sammy do their thing. So quite the little different change, as it, as it were. I was legit about to say it was clean loss. Like, there was no outside interference. So it was really, really awkward to see. There was no Solo on the, on the, on the ring apron. There was no Usos on the ring apron. There was no Paul slipping the belt, you know. Um, so it was interesting, nonetheless, to see that this was a clean loss for Roman and Sammy. Yeah, for sure. So that was very uh, noticeable for that. But we, like we forementioned, Kevin hits the stunner on Sammy and ends up picking the win. As we see John and Kevin celebrate, you mentioned again, Sammy does sort of regroup with the bloodline as a whole in the entranceway. So and that's how we end SmackDown. So interesting and fun way for the crowd. And for the match itself, again, John just made sense for him to kind of just stay on the outside and just get sort of the uh, hope spot and, yeah, just kind of do that. So fun. But, yeah. But now, try to think about as we sort of curtail the year and sort of curtail this match here, kind of what's next for the players involved. Maybe we start off with Cena. So he pretty much just made a couple appearances for the year. Once in the summer, and then obviously for this match. Um, if you had to take a guess, you feel like 
maybe John would have one match in 2023. Do you kind of keep that streak? Do you maybe see anything else? Do you see less? What are your thoughts, brother? I think if if we're talking John Cena's future career in the WWE, I reckon he does keep it alive, his streak this is, with a match at Mania. If that's his only match, that's where I personally would pick, if I was in his shoes, where I would pick to be, because it's Hollywood this year. He's an actor. Right. 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 Yeah. So I reckon, you know, that it's probably one of the better places to have a single match if you're only going to have a match for 2023. Um, because other than that, I don't think that there's anything for him now other than these pokey spots where he comes back maybe he will get the 25 years of always having a match and it'll you know there'll be there'll be these you know significant matches um maybe at mania or SummerSlam or wherever uh, or even just a random show throughout the year to keep the spot alive um i don't i don't really know because he's super part-time like he's a special event uh so yeah, I reckon if he was only have one match in 2023, it would be at Mania, and uh, maybe that's just to keep the streak alive. Okay, sort of off the top of your head, if he was going to have a match at Mania and be his only match, just who would you think he'd face? Ooh, dangerous question. Roman Lattice Reigns. So John faces Roman. Uh, at Mania, interesting. Okay, all right, yeah. Just it's the only person that I can think of right now that he would get away with having a a sort of match that makes sense. I don't want this to be another John Cena calls out the Undertaker, sits in front row, eventually gets his match. Does he get his match? You know, I don't want that whole nonsense. Okay. I would like to have some sort of semblance of making sense to the the fact that he is he's in Hollywood. Maybe he gets called out um, by Roman or somebody else because unfinished business from this match. All right, and Roman wants to assert dominance. Maybe in the first day, you know, on the first night of of WrestleMania. Um, I don't know. I think that's the only person for me. What about yourself? Who, who do you who do you see? Or do you see more than one match? Yeah, I feel like may- maybe it's just the obviously with his schedule and things of such. Maybe it's the one match over the course of the year. But do you feel maybe he puts over a young talent? Maybe as opposed to like a sort of special attraction deal. If he's coming back in the future, yeah, one hundred percent, he puts over young talent. Um, it'd be a special person to maybe take his retirement match, and I like I said, probably at, at the twenty-five year mark. Um, I don't think he has insinuated that he wants to retire anytime soon. Uh, so that's sort of down to him what he thinks, what he's going to do. Um, but I think right now there's nobody. Now the next four months could change, but right now there's nobody currently that I can think of that he would be involved with because he hasn't. He's not as involved in the United States title scene right now. So I I think that the one person that would probably be really good for him to put over as a young talent would be Austin Theory. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, I feel like if it's like a super short program, maybe like a, a month's worth of build, if that, and John's going to mm-hmm. put over a talent, Austin Theory would be a good idea. Who's relatively new. Carrying Cross, ah, just thinking out loud, things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, Just... Maybe Gunther as the Intercontinental Champ. Just have, you know, if he got a win over Cena, that would do really good for him. So just kind of thinking out loud. But yeah, I feel like it'll probably just be something of that nature. Just put over a, uh, a younger guy. So, mm. 100%. All right. What about uh, Owens? Owens has had quite the sort of interesting kind of year. He's, you know, match has been away for my, a while. Have a little match been away for a while and then sort of been for the last couple of months kind of been here so what if anything kind of do you see maybe for owens in the in the coming months slash into the new year 
he is 100% leading, leaning into a title shot with Roman. With this win over Sami, uh, he stays in the picture. The Rumble's coming up at the end of the year, by the way, day before my birthday. Can't wait for it. Always love Rumble season. Um, and it's, uh, it's just one of those things that I can see him building towards this match and then the obvious interference possibly Sammy being called into question maybe he eventually helps Owens maybe you know even though he helps Owens or accidentally hinders the tribal chief uh tribal chief still wins but then you know gets uh storyline continued there so I can see him moving towards a title shot after that I feel like he will probably move towards trying to destroy the bloodline um if that's the case i can you know it, it's there's a lot of moving parts to that i feel like it it would be kevin trying for the title into trying to destroy the bloodline and then the eventual end of the bloodline around wrestlemania season yeah i feel like kevin will probably sort of has unfinished business in a sense with the bloodline so a sort of title shot against roman because obviously the usos have the tag so he's not a tag team but yeah against roman would make sense sort of early in the year maybe at the at the rumble yeah i could see that but then kind of yeah i could see him kind of begin sammy and kevin seem can't can't get away from one another so they would naturally make sense for them if the other shoe drops and sammy ends up being no longer with the bloodline, him supporting his his friend, even though he kind of betrayed, or they betray each other. And it's just constant betrayals, knives and backs, and they, they take the, the knife from my back into yours, like, as appropriate. But I can definitely yeah. see that, but sort of maybe after Mania slash whatever mid before SummerSlam, I don't know maybe what after that, but yeah, that kind of feels like it could fit. Yeah, I mean, WrestleMania season is around the time storylines shift, like the end. Like I said, it's a very real sort of punctuation mark for a lot of things. So um, then we'll see all of the the new crop of NXT talent come up uh, on the the Raw after WrestleMania. So um, you'll 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 probably see the end of a lot of stuff around that time. Um, and yeah, Kevin Owens does Kevin Owens doesn't really have a good track record with friends. Uh the list of KO kind of comes to mind. NXT with uh Sam, NXT his debut with Sami Zayn also comes to mind. Um you know, there's 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 a lot of things that Kevin Owen plays well with, but uh other people is not one of them. Fair enough. All right, and for the bloodline what do you see maybe as a next piece for the for them themselves maybe for the collective maybe you have uh, notions for maybe some of the individuals for the maybe the next coming months this year has been dominated by the bloodline and i appreciate that like it has come into its own um the individuals have all done really really well for solo I can definitely see a title reign um, coming for him in 2023, probably Intercontinental. Probably not beating Gunther for that, but whoever beats Gunther, he will probably beat them. Um, whether or not it's Shamo finally getting his hands on the Intercontinental title, because, you know, uh, Solo has his number, um, and Solo has been able to uh, compete with him, which is really, really good to see. The Usos. By WrestleMania season, I see them holding one or none belts. I really do not know if they are the ones to continue to hold belts for an extended period of time. And I feel like they're the ones that will lose a set of belts. Uh, I don't know. It's just, it's just a feeling more so than anything. Uh, and for as for Roman, he will lose one of his belts. Most likely, the WWE heavyweight title, the black belt, will lose that one because uh, they like the idea of keeping him on SmackDown, which is the universal title. So 
I can see him and the bloodline as a whole going through a sort of downturn. Uh, you know, starting to lose belts. We've talked about it before. If you're going to start to break these guys down, you need to start with the Usos losing belts, and then at WrestleMania is where Roman will lose a belt. Um, but that has to be sort of signified beforehand. Uh, so yeah, it's one of those things. That's how I see it sort of panning out. Like like before, I can't really see past WrestleMania. That's sort of where everything sort of comes in end for me. Because you can never tell who's going to be in a storyline, who's coming back. Um, you know, some of my favorite wrestlers are in WWE at the minute. You got Cody Rhodes coming back to Rumble, winning at number, you know, coming in at number 30 and winning the whole thing. And he's the one that takes the belt off Roman. And then at WrestleMania Backlash, you got Jonah beating Cody um, to take the WWE heavyweight title just because. And then they cycle back and forth for the next however many years because like, they're amazing. Uh, and then you got big old Drew McIntyre in there just competing and, and murdering people and Shamo and Finn Balor and and uh, Damien and, and just Bobby Lashley. And there's so many good wrestlers that I want titles on that I will flip flop between who I want to have a title on them. So I'm not a good person to ask beyond WrestleMania what I want to see because it will it will change on a minute to minute basis. Totally fair. You know, in your response for the bloodline, it's remarkable how interestingly and how close you and I think. And I was kind of going through the same thing and sort of had similar ideas before you even said it out loud. In terms of solo, I could see him holding a singles title, maybe post Summer Slam towards the end of the year. I could def in and if agree, it's if they themselves are still on SmackDown. It would be the baby face that ends up defeating Gunther for it. I feel like he could take it off of that. So I'm in agreement with you. It's it's crazy how similar we think. For the Usos themselves, yeah, I feel like basically by Mania, uh, they'll have the titles off of that. Now that we've gotten a couple more tag teams, Papa H bringing back a few folks, we have the tag division was was thin before, but now we have a couple more that we can. Obviously, we'll keep the Usos together, but we can have them drop the titles and kind of break it back up again and, and try to shine a little spotlight on some of the other folks and kind of give them a, 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 some time in the sun, if you will. So we'll still have the Usos kind of be a little bit more of a special attraction, sort of gatekeeping kind of that piece where they're kind of like they're going to face a tough challenge in them. But let's give some opportunity and type of thing. Let's not have the fans turn on the Usos, even though they have banger matches. You know, it's kind of, we don't want them to get long in the tooth and for kind of fans to turn on them. So, Sammy, the shoe will drop, and however the story pans out, he will no longer be, sort of be in the bloodline. And like I mentioned before, Kevin will kind of be sort of his partner in crime and kind of help come to his support. And they'll sort of be together before they eventually uh, turn on one another again and uh, and break up and feud once again. So, it's kind of like... Uh, as the as the sun rises in the east, it sets in the west, and that's kind of what's gonna happen. 100%. And then for Roman, yeah, honestly, like I I feel like at Mania it'll be a year of him holding both belts. And there are already rumors uh in the past year, earlier in the year, of like, do we have an uh, since Roman won has both titles of Mania? Do we do we have an interim title, you know, type of thing? We heard murmurings of that for like the Raw because he spends so much more time on SmackDown. I know Joker's never a fan of interim. Now the sort of the latest rumors of such has been: Do we create a world title for sort of Raw for purposes of that? Is sort of the sort of newest rumblings, but be that as it may, I feel like the Rumble winner, which we probably feel might be Cody, uh, the American. The American Nightmare Ski. Dang, better be Cody, I'm telling you what. Having him kind of have a championship pursuit at Mania and maybe taking the uh, WWE title, because that's what the uh, his father would have won for uh, the old Dusty finishes and Madison Square Garden thing that from that one promo he was talking about, that one notwithstanding. Yeah, I feel like I kind of want to maybe keep him strong, take one of the deals off of him. We'll hold the... Maybe Universal for a little bit longer. 
drop the other belt sort of maybe in a uh, maybe SummerSlam ish type of time frame maybe like a little Drew perhaps maybe or somebody else who knows and then Roman yeah will kind of be sort of a uh, a little bit more of a special attraction kind of be part-time still but yeah kind of come back to a little pop ski every once in a while and yeah I feel like maybe the bloodline will not be as dominant as they have been especially in a, in a 2022 so yeah it's kind of where I see it going we're sort of in agreement with a number of elements we feel like of what's going to pan out with the aforementioned gentleman in this matchup yeah I feel like this last year for the bloodline has sort of cemented these guys legacy obviously with the uh the Usos being able to hold the belts for as long as they have they've set tons of records for that a record that probably will hold on to Elimination Chamber and up to Mania. Um, so I can see them just setting an unbreakable record for the next tag teams. But like you said, by about Mania, they should lose both of those titles. Um, and once they've lost those titles, they will fade away. So if they do this, they will probably do this in and around an injury, a kayfabe injury. Um, and the same with Solo trying to protect maybe Roman. I want I want them to start to dismantle and have a reason for them to be away. So that whenever Roman does lose his last belt, the the blue belt, he loses it by himself without the bloodline. So that there's nobody backing him up. And it's gone. And once he's lost that title, he goes away. Not this is not like a slight on Roman or anything, but it gives him good opportunity to go away and do other things outside of wrestling and do things that you know he wants to do after two and a bit years of dominance and a really, really good run in the bloodline and a really, really, really good storyline. Now, if that happens or not, I think that whenever he comes back, he will got he will have a huge pop because he will immediately go into um a title reign picture for whoever he wants to go in after because he is the head of the table the tribal chief and he will come back as the tribal chief just maybe not with the bloodline anymore because i feel like as much as i love factions this is not an evergreen faction i want this to sort of end soon not well not soon in the next five months six months let's say I want the bloodline to sort of come to an end. And that's why I didn't mention Sami in the bloodline is I, I don't see him long for the bloodline. And whenever the inevitable happens and he and Kevin do split up, they go into that there. But I don't know how they get to it. I want them to reward Sami by giving him the big belt. They need to make Sami Zayn the title holder for the either the the blue belt or the black belt, I don't care which one, but I think that is a huge reward for someone who has been a top guy for the last year without holding a belt. Like, no one can say anything bad about Sammy in this last year. He has done incredible things, and I think that this should be the one time that maybe he and Kevin go head-to-head for a vacated belt or for Kevin maybe taking the belt off Roman and him being the one that eventually take the belt back off Roman and Sammy comes in and takes it off KO. Sammy's been must-see TV for the last good portion, the last definitely last six months to say the least. So yeah, it would it would be a nice reward. Yeah, and it's probably controversial. A lot of people probably don't want to see that, but I personally think that that person, Sammy Zane, he is a fantastic character. And a fantastic draw for WWE at the minute. And what better way to reward him? And he actually m- mentioned uh, a while ago, and I can't remember if it was in it was in some sort of interview. And he, he said that he went to Vince. He says, why can't I get a push? Why can't I get a title? This, that, and the other. And Vince turned around and just said, it's because you haven't had a heel turn. And then Sammy had that whole heel turn with the conspiracy theorist and that whole going into that there. And that was his initial heel turn that has sort of kind of brought him into it. I think it's funny. It has shown more range for Sammy, 100%. And yeah, it's just it's just something I want to see. 
like I said, there's so many wrestlers on this roster that I want to see have big belts. But um, Sami is definitely maybe second or third in that line. Yeah, for you, Sami is an example. We talked about it in the, earlier in the episode, but we see how these, his journey started in January to where we're at now. We definitely didn't see this kind of coming, and he's certainly grown in a lot of fans' eyes and minds. And Yeah, take it or leave it, but he's definitely a top draw, and people want to see what he does next on shows, so they look forward to whatever he's doing. And yeah, there's just... What it is is what it is. Mm. So it'd be fantastic to see Sammy rewarded in some facet or another. Uh, hopefully in 2023, maybe towards the latter portion. But yeah, I think it would be fantastic and it would do great for locker room morale. And yeah, just be kind of a, a big kind of piece there. So yeah, I think it'd be fantastic. So those were our thoughts on John Cena and Kevin Owens matchup against a interestingly combined bloodline of Roman Reigns and Sami Zayn. Backstage segments just again adding seeds of deceit and sowing the interesting layers that is this continued bloodline storyline itself. The matchup itself and John Cena returning and the Bloodline beings a little bit on the back heels as the year ends. But those were our thoughts. So let us know down in the comment section below on YouTube or hit us up on Twitter, Instagram, and let us know what your thoughts are on the Bloodline, Kevin Owens, and the return of John Cena. All right, so that about wraps it up for us, Joker. How was that, man? It's always uh, we always have a blast when we talk about the bloodline. Always, and it's it's kind of kind of what has been going on. I did push for this, and I really enjoyed talking about it, and I really enjoyed seeing them coming back, and I thought it was just a lot of fun. Yeah, it's always good. It's always fun and and interesting when we sort of vouch or we want to do a particular match or a segment or something that we're sort of enthused about and when we were talking you were like i want to do this i was like yeah cool awesome fantastic we always have better conversations and more enthused just talk when we're super jonesed about whatever the topic is and you know if we're gonna if we're gonna have a last episode of the year and sort of when this is debuted and have a sort of a fresh start on January 1st, when this is released, why not make it about the thing we've been having fun about and might not make it about the bloodline? So I'm for it, and uh, I'm glad you were enthusiastic and, uh, and Jones for this. Oh, yeah, 100%. It's like, if I'm talking about something I don't care about, I'm like, yeah, sorry. So the fact that I can, you know, sit here and laugh about John Cena and his ridiculously you know, ridiculously shouting over the top of microphones and Jessica Carr that, you know, they need to slow down a spot. Like, I missed it so much. It was so good. Um, I just loved, I loved the entire segment. I was a wee bit disappointed that we did see Cena only in the match. I would have liked to have seen maybe some pomp and circumstance around Cena. Um, but hey-ho, you know, that'll come in future. Um... But uh, yeah, there, was, there was definitely a lot to love about this entire episode of SmackDown. I thought it was really good. Uh, there was pieces of it that maybe people didn't like so much. Um, with some returns and some title changes. Um, but there was definitely some, some stuff about this uh, episode that I could not help but just smile at. And uh, that is... That is uh, that is really just all that wrestling is supposed to be about. You're supposed to enjoy it um, and, you know, be entertained. Regardless of the company that you're watching, you're, you're there to be entertained. And if you're not entertained, then they haven't done their job. But this episode thoroughly entertained me. It's a fantastic point. You and I are doing this for fun. And it's one of those things that, you alluded to it earlier, sort of in the intro. It's something we've been banging on about for years. I'd always throw, sort of during your live streams or kind of just in conversation, I was like, uh, when we start that show. And it finally took until 2022, earlier this year. When we both stopped streaming. 
yeah, we're, we're on a bit of a hiatus from our live streams per se, from regularly scheduled live streaming program. But yeah, it's one of those things we kind of just sort of ended up revisiting the idea and, and pulling the trigger on it. And as we see, man, it's been at our first episode in May, and then we're all the way down to now it's the end of the year. It's the end of December. We're going to be starting a new year. We're 32 episodes deep. And at the beginning of the year, I didn't ever think that we would have a we would have a show that we would talk regularly and kind of have this fun, just kind of banter. And like we said, this is all about us just just talking about the things that we really enjoyed in wrestling. It's a common thing that we have again in common. And yeah, man, it's been quite the journey. And for those that have been with us since the early days to, or if you're a new listener slash watcher now, we, and I'll speak for Joker as well, we very appreciate you giving us the time of day, giving us a watch, giving us a listen. Joker and I have been in content creation for quite a while. And, you know, it's one of those where sort of uh, smaller gauge and it's kind of smaller communities. Our communities are small, but they are powerful and supportive, and we appreciate them. But kind of as we try this new endeavor, a lot of folks have been sort of very supportive and and kind of grasping. And folks have downloaded the podcast on all your audio pro your platforms and have watched us on YouTube and have checked out our shorts and things as such. And we just want to say appreciate you. Like I said given us the time, given us the support, given us the watches and listens, and it's been appreciative. So as we wind down this year, thank you for all the support. We hope to continue and, and kind of give you more and a little bit uh, other things as well, hopefully, but we appreciate Into the New Year. Thanks for coming along on this journey with us. 100%. Can only echo, can't say better. Thank you very much for sticking with us. And, uh, yeah, just, we hope you have been entertained. All right. So for one last final time in 2022 for TF Joker. Happiest of 2023s. I hope it goes well. And for me, pretty Tony, we thank you for your time. Let us be a part of your day and your year. And remember, be good to yourself, be good to each other. And we will catch you next time. Happy New Year. Peace.